our next speaker is Dr. Mark Bryan from New, New Zealand. From um, He's the Managing Director of Vet South, a, vet, a 50 vet practice, um, which has a research arm. So, and he's going to speak to you, speak to us today on the efficacy of a novel combination into mammary treatment for mastitis and dairy cows in New Zealand. So over to you, Mark. Yeah, thank you very much, Chairman, and, and thanks for inviting me here today. It's, it's great to be here. Uh, <clears throat> I want to just uh, thank my, my co-authors before I start. So uh, Shane, Sally, Richard Booker, and, uh, and Matt Wells. Uh, what I'm going to do today, and uh, obviously talk about this um, non-inferiority trial, but really just put it in a context, and we've had some really interesting stuff around uh, diagnostics, uh, and of course the secondary context is around antimicrobial use. So I think that, that, that the key for today is to, is to put it into that context. I'll talk a bit about the background from a New Zealand perspective, um, then just outline the study, and then and more importantly, kind of the outcomes that, that have come from that and some, some conclusions. So what you need to understand about New Zealand is that um, it's, we're a seasonally calving uh, dairy industry. The vast majority of our cows uh, live outside and calve outside, and the vast majority of those cows calve in the spring. So um, in any one month in the spring, there's probably a couple of million cows calving. So in the period of, of two to three months, we're, we're going to calve pretty much all our cows down in that period. So it stands to reason that, that mastitis has a very seasonal uh, impact for us. And it also stands to reason that we tend to see a lot of environmental mastitis in the spring and we tend to see the contagious mastitis uh, running through the herd for the rest of the season. The other thing to mention is that we have very, very few gram-negative pathogens that we ever isolate. So if you look at some of the cases, and here's some work we did a couple of years ago, and on, the, uh, on this graph here you'll see days calved by, by, instance of, by number of cases of mastitis from the trial we did. The vast majority of cases happen in the first 21 days after calving, and that's not news to you guys, but uh, for us that means it's a very seasonal effect. If you, if you hone down even further, it's actually quite interesting because within those 21 days, the vast majority of cases are picked up in the first four days. Well, of course, that's the, the colostrum period. So that's when farmers, are, especially air farmers, are being very vigilant uh, and picking up on these cases. And then the second part of this, uh, uh, I guess, this background is, is the, the, the strong prevalence of, of strep uberus and, and staph aureus. Uh, some work that we did, uh, Scott McDougall did uh, a couple of years ago, uh, and we would repeat this in virtually every study we did, but uh, if you pull apart the staphs and the streps and a little bit of discal acti, you know, 85% of our, of our clinical cases are typically uh, gram positives, and then you, if you add in the CNS on top of that, there's another 5 or 10%. So we have a very high proportion of, of, um, of gram positives, and as you see, virtually no gram negatives. Some more work there it just, it just uh, emphasizes that in every single study we do, uh, strep uberus comes out as the prime pathogen and then staph aureus, the next one. Some other interesting stuff from a, a, a clinical perspective, and I, I think this is where it comes down to the diagnostic part, is uh, we've had some really interesting, and I was particularly interested in the dogs for, for diagnosis. I think that's fantastic. We have a paucity uh, of diagnostic tests in, in New Zealand used regularly, and if you can imagine, uh, with the incidence of mastitis uh, sort of focused into those uh, first couple of months after calving, it, it, it does put a bit of pressure on the system. Here's some work, um, and this is looking at the weeks after the start of calving, uh, and the proportion of pathogens, uh, this is clinical mastitis that, from a couple of years ago, but what you'll see is that the uh, initial uh, loading is, is, is uh, strep, as you would expect. That stays fairly high and fairly consistent all the way through the first six weeks. CNS is in the first couple of weeks after calving, and then they tend to drop down. Very, very, very little E. coli from the first six weeks. And interesting enough, in week six, you see a suddenly a bounce up of strep discalactii, and we know why that is, and that's because these cows have been being milked for six weeks, and we wouldn't expect to see discalactii until they've been subject to milking machine damage for a while. So that's the kind of pattern of, of pathogens we see. If you look at a quarter level distribution, some other work we've done, just to emphasize this point again, uh, you can see very, very, very few gram negatives, uh, a lot of staph aureus, CNS, and strep uberus, and it doesn't really matter which quarter uh, you're looking at. The challenge for the farmer is, uh, how does he treat this? Uh, how does he diagnose? How does he differentiate between the, the two main pathogens? And how is he going to treat it? And what, what's the outcome? So streps are our most prevalent, and then staph aureus. 
the other thing to, to bear in mind is that whenever we've done resistance profiling on our staffs, we, we're getting around about 30%, 37%. Scott Madugo did some work just uh, a couple of years ago, and we're getting 28% of, of resistance staffs. So there is a degree of resistance. Penicillin is, of course, our drug of choice. Cloxacillin would be our second-line drug of choice. And here's some uh, bacterial drug cure data pulled out from New Zealand studies from the, from the past uh, uh, five or, or seven years. And we get reasonably good uh, strep uberus cures with penicillin-based treatments. So uh, on the left here, penicillin-based treatments. Uh, when you get into the Staph aureus, you need to obviously move to cloxacillin to get slightly higher cure rates. But we're getting reasonably effective cure rates. The dilemma, again, as I say for the farmers, is, is what to do. So given that the most sensible treatment would be a penicillin and or a cloxacillin. The intriguing thing is the majority of farmers uh, resort to a different type of antibiotic. So they're using an antibiotic which is a combination antibiotic with an aminoglycoside and a macrolide, an oxytetracycline and a prednisolone in it. Now from a responsible antibiotic use, we ideally, uh, we, we would ideally prefer not to use a macrolide. It's a, it's a critically important antibiotic. Uh, aminoglycosides too. So we want to move beyond that into something better. Here's some data that just also um, just sort of colours the picture a wee bit because we've always traditionally said in New Zealand that in spring we get strep uberus and in the rest of the year we get staph aureus. Um, from this study we did get a peak of, of strep uberus in spring but we also got a peak of strep uberus later on in the year. So it's, it's not always, always obvious to farmers or to, or to us what pathogen we're dealing with without without any diagnostics there. So the summary there is that the most, most recommended treatment we would, be, we would have would be penicillin and cloxicillin, uh, but it's not the most commonly used treatment. So the goal in this study was to develop something else. Now the backdrop to this as well, you've got to bear in mind is that uh, last year, the NZVA reduced this, uh, produced this statement about antibiotic use, and it said that by 2030, we will not need uh, to use antibiotics for the maintenance of health and welfare of animals. And that's been a key strategy from the NZVA. It doesn't say we won't treat uh, animals or that we won't actually use antibiotics, it's just saying it'd be nice to not have to need them. On the back of that, we produced some judicious use guidelines, and I've already alluded to the fact that we, uh, we've graded these antibiotics into, uh, uh, similar to the uh, OIE and the WHO guidelines as to what we would like to use and what we uh, would prefer not to use, and then the ones that we really don't want to use. So in terms of the study, it was a, it was a fairly straightforward study. Um, we took about uh, 28 farms across Southland, uh, enrolled cases of clinical mastitis, uh, GCP level studied, bacteriology was performed. Um, the cases were sampled uh, pre-treatment and then we had three post-treatment samples. Uh, and then from a, if you, any of those of you that are statistically minded, we did a GLM to, to manage the stats at the end of that and then we corrected that for over dispersion. This is what it looked like from a timeline perspective, so the text come in. Uh, uh, doing a whole bunch of tests, uh, they're getting the, the, the product. So the product we're using uh, is, a, is a penicillin, cloxicillin-based product. So it's got, a gram of, um, it's got a gram of penicillin and 200 milligrams of, uh, of cloxicillin. And then the reference product, which is the product which is the, uh, it's got the aminoglycosides and the prednisolone in. And so that's what happened. And then any, any clinical failures were removed from the trial. So it's a fairly standard trial uh, uh, protocol. And what did we find? Well, from the cases that we found, and bear in mind this is a non-inferiority trial, um, there's a few exclusions, obviously. Um, the ultimate uh, outcome was that the, the, the new product was non-inferior to the existing product. More importantly, from a clinical perspective, if you look at the uh, bacteriological cure proportions for Staph aureus, uh, we did get quite a difference in uh, bacteriological cure proportions. And I think that, that from a pharma perspective, is, is quite important. Uh, the cure proportions for the other uh, main pathogens, strep uberus and strep are pre pretty similar. Uh, if you look here at the um, non-inferiority graph, you can see that here's the, here's the control product, here's the staph aureus. So you see almost, almost superiority, but not quite. Uh, strep uberus is identical, and these are the uh, raw data and the adjusted for over-dispersion data. Probably a, a wee bit um, disappointing was that the, the clinical failure rate was similar. So if you're trying to reduce antibiotic use, uh, we actually want to reduce the number of retreatments, and somebody made reference to that this morning, and I think that's an important thing. How many, how many retreatments can we, can we get away with? So uh, in this case, we're getting around about um, 
20 percent, which is very, which is our kind of standard clinical failure rate. So there's no difference in the treatments. The so the summary for this, I think, um, more for discussion than anything else, is that, that we show that that new combination product and it is reasonably unique, and, and for our environment, it, it seems to fit uh, very well with the sort of pathogen pathogens that we're trying to uh, trying to treat. Uh, so it was, we're pleased to see that it was, it was uh, certainly effective and it was non-inferior. Um, we know which are the key pathogens, so we're doing a good job there. Uh, we also did, and I haven't brought this uh, to the table here, but we did quite a bunch of uh, all, these path all these cultures were resistance tested. So we did find, uh, just, to, just to confirm that, we're getting 30 odd percent uh, penicillin resistance amongst the, amongst the staph aureuses, which is typical and, and similar to what we've seen before. We did find as well, and there's some work going on at the moment in New Zealand around um, resistance of strep uberis to coxicillin or to oxicillin, so, so there's a question mark over that. We're not, we're not going to report on that. Uh, and, and the other key thing, I think, is that the idea that we could be treating, and this is a kind of, it might be a kind of a Kiwi idea, but in, in the spring you treat strep uberis with a penicillin-based treatment, and then later on you treat staph aureus uh, with a coxicillin-based treatment. You know, that is, that is no longer the case that we're seeing um, strep uberis appearing all the way through the season, and, and staph aureus is present all the way through the season too. And the other point is that the vast majority of farms ha have got both pathogens working at the same time. You know, it's, it's from a farmer perspective, they, they don't just have one pathogen. We know that. But for farmers, that's a kind of an often a novel concept. The final thing is, is, <coughs> is there any um, benefit in, in, in terms of prudent use of antimicrobials? So I've already alluded to the, to the, to the repeat treatment process. And um, unfortunately, we didn't get a, a, a reduction in, in the re repeat treatment, but we are moving away from, uh, from using aminoglycosides and, and macrolides. So in that respect, we're, we're a wee bit more comfortable in that, in that realm. Now, both the OIE and the WHO are not overly keen on us using penicillin. <coughs> Excuse me. But the OIE in particular is, is probably a little bit more um, understanding that we do like to use penicillin that is effective in animals. Certainly, coxacillin isn't on the radar in such a, in such a respect, so it's not such a key, a key issue. So really, with that, I'd just like to um, stop and, and thank everybody involved, so particularly the technicians uh, and, and to Verbeck, who, who funded the study and the technicians involved. It was a reasonably onerous GCP-level study, uh, and I'd like to just open up for any questions or, or discussion. Okay, thanks very much, Brian. Uh, Mark, Mark. <laughs> Um, so, any, any questions there for Mark? Um, while, while strep uberus is, is classically considered uh, an environmental organi organism, <coughs> our experience here would suggest that it, it can be spread in a contagious manner. Would, would, would you have a similar, similar finding? Yeah, I, I think it's a good point. Um, and there was, a, there was a presentation early on this morning around the, the contagious nature of strep uberus. Uh, I mean, we haven't identified that ourselves in, a, in our group, but um, seeing that presentation this morning, there's obviously a, a, a risk of that. So it's something we, sh we should be aware of. Okay, down there. Just one question, maybe I missed it. Um, how many of these cases that you treated were repeat cases already? So cows that had been treated in the same or previous lactations before in the same quarter, so, so that, would there be a difference in that? Yeah, so, um, so the, the criteria for inclusion was that they hadn't been treated within the past 28 days, so um, I'd, I'd, I'd have to go back to the data. Some of them would have been treated prior to 28 days, but, but obviously not in the, in the preceding month. Okay, any, any further questions? Okay, th thanks very much, Mark.